Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar, How to Protect the Freedom to Read in Your Library, presented by SAGE and ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom. Before we, get, we begin, please take a moment for a quick poll. Thank you. It looks like 60% of you come from a public library, 7% from a school library, 20% from an academic library, 2% from a special library, and 10% of us. All right, let me begin by introducing you to our speakers today. First, we have Kate Lechtenberg. After teaching high school English for 10 years in New York, Connecticut, and Iowa, Kate earned her MA in Library and Information Studies at the University of Iowa. She is currently a teacher librarian in, in Iowa, and she was recently appointed to the AASL Standard and Guidelines Implementation Task Force. We also have Kristen Peacock. She is Assistant Director of ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom. She's part of a five-person team dedicated to promoting the right to read and providing education about the First Amendment. Kristen communicates with state library associations on current book challenges and publications that deal with censorship, privacy, ethics, and internet filtering. She organizes online education and training on the freedom to read and how to navigate reconsideration requests and media relations. Kristen started her career as a youth libra librarian in West Bend, Wisconsin. In 2009, over 80 young adult LGBTQ books were challenged over six months. While the library board voted to retain all of the books in this case, she learned the indispensable value of support and education for librarians. She continues to fight against censorship in Wisconsin as the Intellectual Freedom Roundtable Chair until she moved to her current position at ALS. We also have Scott R. DeMarco. He's Director of Library and Information Resources at Mansfield University of Pennsylvania. He has 20 years experience in different types of library, libraries and has been an academic library director for the last 15 years. He has a BS and an MA in History from SUNY Brockport and an MLS from SUNY Buffalo. He has been an audio, he has been a book and audio book reviewer and is a blogger for the Huffington Post. This is a one-hour webinar and will be recorded and archived for future viewing. We will send out a link, um, a link to view it and to access all the slides to all the registrants in the coming weeks. And finally, my name is Vicky Baker and I'm the deputy editor of Index on Censorship magazine, the quarterly publication of the London-based Freedom of Expression NGO. I previously worked for The Guardian in, in London and for Reuters in Buenos Aires. Index on Censorship was founded in 1972 and is based on the need to, originally inspired by the need to smuggle information out of Eastern Europe in particular. We now cover freedom of expression issues and violations worldwide. And we do that through our quarterly magazine, our events, our website, advocacy work, and through our annual Freedom of Expression Awards. If you have any problems with the audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box at the right of your screen, and one of our helpful team members will get back to you ASAP. At the end of the webinar, we will have some time for some Q&A from attendees, so please also use the Q&A box to ask any questions to speakers throughout the webinar. Please also take note of the webinar hashtag, 
hashtag free to read 15 and feel free to ask questions or leave comments there. Right, without further ado, I'll pass on to our first speaker, Kate Lexenberg. I forgot to mute. I forgot to unmute. That's the biggest no-no of a um, of a webinar, and I've gone ahead and gotten that out of the way for everybody. So now, hopefully, you can hear and see the slides. So again, I'm Kate Lechtenberg, a teacher librarian in Iowa, and I'm really happy to be here talking with you guys today. Um, so today, I want to talk to you about my mental journey toward. A, toward a better approach to intellectual freedom in my school library. I really believe that teaching anything worth teaching takes a lot of time, reflection, risk-taking, and collaboration. And so whether you work in a school or not, if you're passionate about intellectual freedom, we're all teachers on this issue together. So I welcome your feedback in the comments and on social media, and I hope to hear more about what you're thinking and teaching as well. And so before I launch into my story, I'd like to take the emotional temperature of our little virtual room here. Um, so please take a minute to the, respond to the poll that Camille is going to push out right now. And um, let us know how you feel leading up to Band Books Week. What, what kinds of emotions are, are floating out there in your mind? So just take a few minutes to respond to that poll. Okay, so um, good. It, it, I feel better. It, it's a mix of emotions, which is often how I feel as well. Um, so, um, you know, I often have a love-hate relationship with Band Books Week. Um, can you all, are we all back to my slides here? Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, so on one hand, you know, I've got this gorgeous I Read Band Books bracelet that I wear uh, because obviously as a librarian, I am passionate about promoting diverse literature and the right to, to read free from limitations and restrictions. But on the other hand, sometimes I cringe when I see I Read Band Books all over the place and Band Books Week uh, materials and t-shirts and all the merchandise on social media and um, and in libraries because there's something that feels a little bit self-righteous about it or something that suggests that maybe I read banned books because they're banned. But really, I'm not a crusader and I'm not a flag waver. Above all, I read to be engaged with ideas, not to make a statement. So yes, Banned Books Week is such an important event for our profession each year, but I'm also continuously frustrated with myself and with our profession sometimes for putting all the intellectual freedom eggs in one banned books basket. Uh, I know it's not the ALA's intent that we talk about the freedom to read only during Banned Books Week, but like Black History Month or Veterans Day, these commemorative events can, if we're not careful, serve both to spread the word and to box the conversation into, into some pretty intractable boundaries of a special day, week, or month. And so often, in the start of school rush of August and September, it's hard for me to lay the groundwork, and frankly, I haven't done a good job of it. And um, it's hard to make Banned Books Week part of a celebration that does more than elicit this sort of one-dimensional reaction from the judgmental people who ban books are stupid. That's something I often hear my students say, um, which comes from a good place, but is not quite what we want. Um, to the confused, if these books are banned, why are they in the library? 
Um, to the insulted, is Miss Mel making fun of me if those books are ones that my mom doesn't want me to read? That's not what I want. And so I haven't been laying that groundwork. And But in the last year, I've been doing a lot of soul searching about how I take on my professional responsibilities on intellectual freedom issues. And as I review Empowering Learners Guidelines for School Library Programs, my own self-assessment tells me that, yes, we have excellent policies on the um, on file for selection and reconsideration of materials, but honestly, I haven't even touched the outreach or leadership components of what brings those policies alive. Um, many factors have brought me to this new, renewed focus on how I approach intellectual freedom. Partially, it's the lukewarm reaction to dis displays I've done in the past. Um, I haven't even taken pictures of them, they're so forgettable. Um, but it's also my unease with the more visually appealing displays that I see on Pinterest and Twitter. And be, because while these, while these displays are provocative and, and they really get people talking and thinking, I sometimes worry that they could be perceived as mocking people who choose not to read certain books. Would these displays discourage parents and students from talking with me about books that make them uncomfortable? That's not what I'm going for, and I know that's not what anyone intends. Another factor that has really made me focus on these issues recently is that ever-present and seemingly ever-increasing stories of censorship right in my own backyard. Um, as my district works to provide more reading choices for students in their curricular and independent reading, we might, like many schools out there, are fielding questions about the books we choose. And in my state, there was recently a very public story about a challenge um, to the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian in Waterloo, Iowa that got quite a bit of media coverage. And so all of these things have come together to make me realize that if we're going to have bu Banned Books Week, it simply cannot be the first conversation that I have with my students and school community. Because if it is, it's simply too little, too late. So what's the alternative? Well, in the last year, I have taken the Office for Intellectual Freedom up on, on its offer to be a resource and a sounding board. And I've had some brainstorming sessions with Kristen Peekle, the assistant director at OIF, who you'll hear from in a few minutes. And I told her about my desire to have a Talk to Your Stakeholders Week, in which I would take one day out of the week to talk to my librarian colleagues, administrators, teachers, parents, and students. Just some small conversations to get the ball rolling before Band Books Week. And as I talked to Kristen, I realized that I'd already kind of started this process a bit back in April when I created a five-minute video in the Ignite Talk format, um, if any of you are familiar with that, um, to get my students started on their first literature circle discussions in their lit literacy classes. My message to them in this video was really about the choices we had entrusted them to make when selecting their books and the responsibilities that come along with discussing mature issues in their books. I also shared my experiences um, as a young person learning how to put a book back when it was not right for me. Uh, back when I was 11, I decided that I was totally ready for Sweet Valley High, but reading one part of Jessica and Elizabeth's high school adventures really told me that I needed to go back to Sweet Valley Twins. Um, so I, I, I just firmly believe that that's a really important part of being a reader. And so Kristen encouraged me to see that um, to see that conversation in that video as a first step in building this conversation. So this year, as I've been welcoming our new students to the school, um, I've been trying to sprinkle in ideas about the freedom to read and explain to them why our library has this diverse collection. Uh, so when our new students came to the library for the first time, I explained to them that buying books for our school is complicated and that I read reviews and I read widely, uh, but the fact is that many books are aimed at middle schoolers or high schoolers, and we have both in our school. So really, our students need to be the, the um, ultimate selectors for themselves. Other things I've been working on in my school, I have these mental gym stations set up throughout the library for some thinking and goal setting habits, sort of stretching your brain like you'd stre stretch your body. And one of, those, um, one of those stations is about exercising your right to read. And I encourage students to, um, to read our selection policies and to sign our um, School Libraries Change Lives Declaration for the Right to School Libraries um, declaration there. 
So these are all small steps that I've been working toward. Um, and there's a little blurb that I have for them just to explain what selection policies are and um, why we have them. I'm also trying to work on a video um, version for my parents um, as well, a short video that I'd like to share on Twitter and our school's online newsletter and on our library website because I want to explain to parents how I can support their students as readers and why our library includes that diverse collection of books. And I've drafted a script, but I haven't quite gotten to make the video yet, but here are a couple key, mo key quotes from what I want to say to them. It's so important that our collection be diverse because every one of your children is unique. A book that's not right for one student might be just right for another, and it's my job to serve all our teenagers. Yes, each parent has, has the right to guide his or her child's reading, but my job is to make sure that our library includes books to serve every parent's child. Um, on the lighter side, I also share with them my experience as a parent, steering my daughter away from the middle school romance and sassiness of Dork Diaries back when she was seven. She's read them now as a fourth grader, um, but at that time I just wasn't ready for her to read those and I didn't think she needed to be delving into middle school yet. So I'm trying to connect with my parents in that way. This year, um, I don't have a slide for this because this just happened yesterday, but I also just have started making some small visits with my faculty as well. Yesterday I visited with our earth science teachers and just shared with them our school board policy that's about teaching controversial issues, and I shared a few resources to help them respond to student concerns about how their study of the earth's origin relates to students' religious views. Um, so I'm just trying to sprinkle in those little, those little conversations. So this is a start. And in addition, um, outside of work, Kristen Pickle and I have decided, have returned to, the, to my idea of the Talk to Your Stakeholders Week. Um, and we decided to start in the natural place, with librarians ourselves. We created this brief Q&A for librarians to jumpstart important conversations that librarians need to take the time to have with each other. Um, and as you look at the document, you can see that it's kind of a Q&A, but it's also got um, some strategies and resources because, you know, even though we are supposed to be the experts on these issues, we need to have a place and we need to create time so that we can ask each other questions, we can really break down these issues and access all the great resources that are out there. One of my favorites is um, Helen Adams' Intellectual Freedom Calendar, which is on this, linked on this document, and you can also just kind of Google it, uh, because it really, she really addresses the concern that, I, that got me started on this, was the idea of the once a year banned books week, and she breaks down each month, month by month, how can you incorporate intellectual freedom into your calendar. Um, so Kristen and I are, are hoping to continue creating resources, um, hopefully next we'll move on to administrators, and I know that the conversations I've had with my principal will help me inform the next step that we take. So here I am, mucking through the journey, going from the flash in the pan Van Books Week display to hopefully a thoughtful journey towards smaller yet more substantial moments that can plant seeds and create a ripple effect throughout our community. Right now, if you were to ask students, parents, teachers, administrators in my school about the freedom to read, responses would be spotty, and I know that there would still be much misinformation, apathy, and maybe even some hostility. But right now, I'm happy to be doing the hard, messy work that it takes to build an understanding of, um, of intellectual freedom in a way that respects all perspectives. And I hope that by next year's Banned Books Week, we'll have an even stronger understanding of these core values that are embedded in our school's policies. And I hope we'll have a better understanding of how our actions and conversations as readers can bring those values to life. Thank you. And um, if you've got any questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat and we'll get to them in the Q&A. Right now, we're going to pass the baton on to Kristen Peekle, the Assistant Director of the Office for Intellectual Freedom. Thank you, Kate. Let me get my slides up here. Okay. Everyone can see my slides? Kate, you are a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I say thank you for all that great information um, and thank you to Sage Publishing for including me into this panel. Um, I really appreciate it.
Okay. So these are my amazing colleagues at the Office for Intellectual Freedom. Um, I'm the newbie on the right. I've been working here only for about a year. Everybody else has been like 10, 15, 17 years. The Office for Intellectual Freedom strives to educate librarians and the public about the nature and importance of intellectual freedom in libraries. Libraries are a forum for information and ideas under the First Amendment, and librarians are tasked to make sure that every person has equitable and unrestricted access. At OIF, our first priority is to make sure that all librarians, educators, and users know this. Our second priority is to fight any attempts to limit or remove access. Before I relocated to Chicago and started working at ALA, I was a young adult librarian in Wisconsin. I grew up wanting to be a librarian. I had spent most of my teen years not only reading in libraries, but volunteering as well. And I got my master's degree and in uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. I got my first job in West Bend, and I loved my job. I host author visits and Star Wars days, and I worked with teen volunteers. And when new books came in, it was like Christmas. I was vaguely aware of censorship. I mean, come on, I've done a banned books week display every year. And then it landed in our book drop, literally. Uh, Tuesday morning in February, hang on one second while I adjust my slides. Okay, one minute. All right, forgive us for a moment while we just try to navigate the slides here. Okay, well, we'll keep going, um, and I can follow up with any information that's missed later. So it was Tuesday morning um, in February. This was 2009. Actually, it was February 3rd, to be exact. I don't know why I will always remember that date. We received a letter in our book drop expressing intense outrage at a teen reader's advisory page on our website. It was titled, Out of the Closet, Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender Fiction and Nonfiction. There was a library board meeting scheduled for that night, and the patrons wanted to be added to the agenda to speak in front of the board. Public meeting laws prohibited us from changing the agenda. There were a lot of public policies that tied the library's hands, and that frustrated the family. By Friday, the local newspaper led with this headline, Libraries Gay Link Criticized. The story was kept alive in the media, mostly because the patron was an avid blogger. She liked to recount her version of the meetings and share her displeasure with the work that librarians do, and how she felt that we had a liberal gay agenda, and we were trying to convert the youth in her community to turn gay. She posted many book reviews and would quote sections that she thought were offensive and inappropriate. While she blogged, and created petitions and hosted meetings that the public could attend to, but only if they were 18 and over, um, to find out about these horrible books. There were others in the community who started to rally in support.
The original complainant had started West Bend Citizens for Safe Libraries. Library supporters worked under the name West Bend Parents for Free Speech. Both groups organized petition drives, protests, marches, Facebook groups, book clubs. They wrote letters. to the newspaper and to the library board members and they would post information about the library board meetings and encourage attendance. From the American Library Association, Angela Maycock and Deborah Caldwell Stone drove up from Chicago to talk to the community about the First Amendment and the right to read. I'll never forget that day. It meant so much to me and I will always be grateful for their support and advice. Right after they finished their talk, we hosted a read-in. Every chair in the library had a reader in it, and most of them were wearing buttons promoting free speech and stop censorship. There was a march from the middle school to the library. About 80 people attended. We received some amazing support from organizations all over the country. Even authors spoke up and contacted us in support of our fight for the freedom to read. Sitting at my desk right now is the autographed copy of Perks of Being a Wallflower from Stephen Chbosky. Even after the challenge, pe even after the challenge, people continued talking about the books and the freedom to read. The Fourth of July parade in our community included a float with a washing machine and signs and bookmarks saying, "Keep our library clean." It was so amazing to see the number of people show up and speak at library board meetings. I have some of these videos saved on YouTube if you're interested in watching them later, especially the teens. They are incredibly um, poignant to watch. But at the end of the day, on June 2nd, 2009, four months after it all started, the library board voted to keep all 86 books on the shelf. No sexually explicit labels, no moving them to the adult collection, all the books staying free and accessible to anyone who wants to read them. We were lucky. At the time of the challenge, we had a very knowledgeable and supportive director and library board. But censorship really can happen to any library or school or bookstore or classroom. Challenges can present itself in a lot of different ways. Not every complainant is going to know about the library's procedure or want to follow the policy. Censorship could be an email from a parent to a school board member or a letter to the editor in the newspaper. It's important to know your library's specific policy for handling complaints about materials, displays, websites, or programs. Every policy is different. If you ever want help reviewing it, don't hesitate to call our office. And as well as the importance of your policy is the mission statement. Your library's mission statement will help you communicate to your patrons why and how you serve everybody by including all viewpoints. One of the greatest assets of a library is their librarians. Better than any Google search, online list, book rating app is the personal experience and expertise embedded in every reader's advisory interaction between a patron and a librarian. Learn to say, we carry materials for every patron, but our librarians are happy to help you find materials to meet the specific needs of your family. Reader's advisory is a skill and a service libraries provide but don't often advertise. Play it up. Use shelf markers or create reader's advisory programming or display signs. Encourage your patrons to make use of the librarians in order to create a welcoming space for the specific family. Create reminders about the library's neutral neutrality. Sometimes libraries have a stereotype of being liberal or progressive, and that's okay. But it's helpful to the patrons who have different points of view that we demonstrate and aim to create an inclusive and neutral environment. For example, you may want to have your library board look into creating a neutrality statement. You could post a neutrality statement on a policy wall or your website. You could create a disclaimer statement to add to programming flyers and displays. 
be intentional about the topics and selections for, displaying, for displays and programs. If you're going to host an anti-violence peace lecture by a pacifist who is a public Bernie Sanders supporter, maybe also organize a gun safety workshop with background on open carry rights and the Second Amendment history. It's easy to create displays on topics we know and love, or to book a program speaker who we personally know and are friends with. But as a professional librarian, we need to strive to pre present educational and entertaining programs and resources, resources for everyone in our community with all interests and all viewpoints. If you think about it, that only makes our job easier. We will have more resources to work with, more books to display, more potential speakers, more ideas to express. And here's where it's going to get sticky. I'm going to share specifically what the West Bend Library did to serve their patrons. During the challenge, the patron who issued the complaint argued that the library was promoting a gay agenda. As proof, she offered our lack of books on the ex-gay movement. To prove our neutrality and to stay true to our mission to provide a collection of diverse materials, we purchased titles that fit our library's selection policy. There was a need, there was a desire, we had the funds in our budget and the space on our shelves. We found books that were well-reviewed and in our price range and accessible by our distributor. Even if I'm personally offended by materials in our library, as a professional, I do my job. I imagine there may be librarians who disagree with adding these books. It's part of the gray area of self-censorship and collection development. But it's how the West Bend Library chose to meet the needs of angry parents and still promote the freedom to read and keep books with gay teenagers on the shelf. I can't convey how important it is to include the Library Bill of Rights in your policies. The second point states, libraries should provide materials and information presenting all points of view. If we want to protect our libraries from censorship of ideas we hold dear and books we love we need to be willing to defend access to ideas we abhor and the books we detest. The hardest part of my job is talking to librarians and teachers who feel forced or threatened to be silent. It's the quiet, little, insidious, confidential challenges that break my heart. I need to leave you with this last slide to encourage you to report any challenge. Whether the challenge happens to you in your library, or it happens to a colleague teaching a book in her classroom, or as a parent, your child come home, comes home and tells you that she can no longer read a book for her assignment, please report it. Please talk about it. Don't just let it happen. Stand up and speak your mind. Defend your right to read and the right to read for others who can't stand up. Thank you. And next up is Scott DeMarco, Director of the North Hall Library at Mansfield University. How am I going to beat that? I mean, I, I, Kate, Kristen, you've done a better job than I'll probably do. So, thank you. Uh, again, I'd like to thank ALA and I'd like to thank uh, Sage for providing me the opportunity to talk about it. Um, I want to talk uh, and tell you a little bit about uh, stories about what we've got here and some of the things that we've done at uh, an academic library in uh, Pennsylvania. Again, I don't really think censorship's the biggest problem that we've got to deal with when it comes to banned books. I think the biggest problem we've got to deal with is apathy and the ability just to say somebody else can deal with it. Somebody else can make this a problem. Um, and I don't necessarily agree with that. Next slide, please. Now I said, uh, again, I am in uh, beautiful Mansfield, Pennsylvania, and for those of you who watch Game of Thrones, we are a bit north of the wall. And this is a beautiful picture of Mansfield on a sunny July day. Uh, we're in a small community, a rural community that's generally conservative. Uh, Truly, we have more cows than we have people that live here. 
So it, it's a pretty nice place to live. And one of the things we try to do every year is um, talk, you know, library week, band books week, constitution week, all of that. And with all of them, we found there to be very little interest um, beyond the theoretical. Everybody agrees with it, but they don't necessarily um, believe it has an impact on them. Next slide, please. Again, that is really North Hall on a beautiful day, and it, it's a nice place. As I was saying, uh, Band Books Week, we do it as an annual event, and we had, you know, a handful here, a handful there. In 2012, I think we hit the low point. We had six attendees and five were from the library. So we decided that we were going to have to do something different uh, to get people's attention and to really bring this important matter to to their attention, really. Next slide, please. So what we were able to do is work with a, a local personality. Uh, our director of public relations is a pretty well-known guy on campus. Everybody likes him. He's the, the gentleman in the top hat, um, Dennis Miller. A very well-known fellow, uh, very big on social media. Uh, Really, really the kind of guy everybody's their friends with. And he came to our, he was the, the only non-library attendee that one year. So he asked, quite honestly, if we could ban his book. And he was joking about it, obviously. But um, that little bit of um, humor took root. Next slide, please. And we were very fortunate. Dennis had just come out with a, a book he'd written. And it was a Western, and it deals with all the hot topics that people uh, don't want to touch. It deals with uh, violence, uh, post-Civil War, uh, murder, rape, um, vengeance, killing, and dealing with, uh, you know, definitely taking a violent approach to most situations, the things you don't see in the old-time Westerns. But I could also say it's got a very pro-feminist and very pro-equality uh, point of view to it, and he does use bad language in it as well. So he was very, very um, gracious, I would say, to allow us to see and to use his work. Next slide, please. So what we had planned to do was um, only a few of us knew about it. Uh, the other library staff didn't know about it. We didn't have a big launch. We had decided we were going to ban his book. Uh, what I can say is we were smart enough, not me, somebody else was smart enough to say, we need to get prior presidential approval. Uh, they knew we were going to do something, but they didn't exactly know all the details. So if I, if I had any advice, I would say definitely bring uh, the decision makers into the loop a little bit. Next slide, please. And we did a very simple thing. Uh, uh, we did a two-sentence uh, memo written on letterhead. We put it out on our Facebook site that said, due to uh, a complaint, uh, we have decided at this point to, to uh, we found it to be inappropriate due to extreme violence and sexual content, and it will be banned from the library. And that's it. No announcement was made, just a one this little thing that went out on a, our Facebook site. Next, please. Then the problem started. Uh, immediately we've got an angry reaction from students, uh, alumni, other interested parties. Remember, this was a very popular and very social media savvy guy. Uh, within 20 minutes we had complaints from uh, the local newspaper, we had Facebook protest pages and petitions that were started. Uh, people were very angry, and they felt very comfortable voicing their opinion. And honestly, uh, I enjoyed it. I was glad to see people actually taking a stand rather than that apathetic point of view, which I've seen so often. Um, and then you even get the one person, I didn't know we still banned books. Well, you know, you really do. And this went on, and you know, it started and started, and people got very angry. Um, less than um, 
uh, one of the things that was less than popular was most of the people decided they were going to make the comments via social media, uh, via angry calls, but only eight people out of a campus of about 3,000 actually decided that they were going to do something about it, uh, schedule meetings with me, uh, discuss it, how to reverse the ban. The rest used it as a point to vet. And what I noticed more than anything else was with the books and with this book in particular and this censorship ban, we were dealing with people who this just opened up the steam valve for other complaints they had. The economy, somebody parked in their parking spot, uh, a general sense of uh, distrust of the administration, the government, um, people in general, me, and it, it got pretty interesting. I knew we had really done something big and it really took off when my kids, who are uh, elementary school age at the time, were complaining to me because they were hearing about it at school. They said, you, do you believe what your father did? Do you understand this? And, you know, it was, I knew we'd really done something then. Next slide, please. So what we learned and what, you know, hopefully you can learn a little bit, the reaction was uh, much quicker than we originally anticipated. We thought it would be up for about a week and we might get, you know, a handful of people who might be interested, who might say something. We were just hoping somebody had noticed it. But you're talking about something that really took off and we were only able to keep it up for a few days before we had to bring it down because it was causing so much controversy. What I would say was it was a concrete effort with something they knew. Rather than going and saying, well, I disagree or, you know, I agree that, that uh, censorship is bad, they were dealing with somebody they had to see. They saw the person who banned it, they saw the person who got banned, and they saw the library where it actually occurred. What I would say was, like was mentioned before, file the complaints, talk to people, work to solve the problem, not just to address what you can consider to be something wrong. Next slide, please. Ultimately, what happened was we were able to put another message out in a, in a different, same manner on Facebook and talk about why we had done this. This was a lesson. Uh, this was to combat the apathy and the indifference to the, to the topic. Yes, it was unorthodox. Yes, it was highlighted in a very different manner. But we dealt with a capricious and arbitrary decision that was made, and quite honestly, we don't agree with that. And we were able to get people involved in a different sort of way. Um, and it talks about, you know, you'll read it. Next slide, please. I would like to say I would take all the credit, and I will gladly take all the credit, but I can't. The two individual, the one individual on the left and the two individuals on the right were the ones who really did a lot of it. I just happened to make it official in a lot of ways. And these are librarians and staff involved in the situation, involved in the day-to-day, -day working you know, to make something different. Uh, the two ladies on the right, actually what they're doing this week is they've got a NCAA-type bracket for banned books. And um, as of about an hour ago, what we were dealing with was uh, uh, Catcher in the Rye versus uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Those were the two that were in the finals. Next, please. Some of the aftermath that you can take uh, for what it was, was the Huffington Post actually grabbed a hold of this a little earlier than most. Um, and I've got to say, I wrote an article and it got numerous rejections. I don't even think my mother was interested in reading it. And then a um, uh, small library, you know, CNRL News picked it up and then the Huffington Post came to me and they wanted to pick it up. It went viral. So I was very happy to see that it did strike a chord nationally. Uh, it became a regular blog that I do on, on censorship and other issues. Reddit picked it up. 
what I did find was a few problems. Suddenly, people were coming to me asking about more about censorship, which I'm more than happy to talk about. But I was surprised to see how really invasive it is. We've even had a situation where a uh, local school district did it. I was brought in. I talked a little bit. Nothing really changed. Ultimately, from the library user's point of view, uh, we were able to deal with a very general and a very positive reaction. Generally, from my peers and my other librarians, it was considered to be too controversial. So you take it what it's worth. Next slide, please. Again, you know, there's other areas where you can get a lot more information. Uh, I just told you a story about what, what happened at Mansfield, and I am more than happy to answer any questions via social media or anything else you've got. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Scott. I love your honesty there and giving us some sort of new insight. Um, and thanks also to Kate and, and Kristen. It was fascinating to hear, hear all your stories and experiences. Um, hearing sort of perspectives that we don't often think about, and certainly what the general public would consider. Um, we're now going to spend some time addressing some of the questions from the audience. So please continue to send them in the question box on the right-hand side of your screen, or on Twitter using the hashtag free to read 15. If we can't get to your question by the end of the hour, our speakers have kindly agreed to address them in a follow-up blog post, which will be posted on the SAGE blog, SAGE Connection. OK, our first question that's, that's come in is for uh, Kristen. Um, the question is, I've had two books in the past year that, per in the past year that parents have challenged and complained about. Do parents need to fill out something in order for us to report the challenge? Or is it just that complaint should is just that their complaint should be reported? No, we don't ask that the parents fill out anything specific. Um, the report is really um, for for librarians to share with us um, that a challenge occurred. So. Um, If the parent in your school has two books that they want, I mean, it's one thing if they're voicing a concern about the book. They want to talk to the librarian about it. They're complaining. They're not happy about it. But if they actually want the book removed from the collection or removed from the classroom and denied access to other students, that is a challenge that you should report to our office. Hopefully that answers the question. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. We've got a second one coming up now. Um, so the question is to all panelists, when you submit a challenge form to the OIF, does the OIF respond with help or thoughts pertaining to the item in question, or is it prim primarily just recorded as data? That's everybody. So um, when things come to OIF, we, my, um, our administrative assistant sends me an email every Monday, and she attaches every report that's come in in the past week. So this is just a weekly report. And I go through them, and I try to see if, if it's just a standard report, and this has happened in the past year, and they just want to let us know about it, great. I send a quick thank you and email. If it's something that is currently going on and they need some help with it, I try to follow up with questions, or with you know, like a, um, a reaching out email as quickly as I can. So it, it depends. Um, it can be both. Great. Thank you. Um, I've got a question for Scott next. Do you feel that, um, that you had lost any of your public trust by doing what is essentially a, world, a war of the world situation, since you had no intention of banning the Miller did your public feel played? I'm sure some did. I know some of the librarians felt that way. Uh, the overall response we've gotten was not that. It was more that it was an object lesson than anything else. And um, it's one of those things where I believe, you know, apathy is the greatest, the greatest problem here as opposed to the censorship issue. Great, thanks, Scott. 
We got the next question. Um, this is a question to um, Kristen. What is wrong with the common sense media that ALA has, um, has deleted it from rating school books and want others to do the same? ALA's um, policy position on rating is that it can be prejudicial against books, um, and it is a form of censorship to rate books. Um, a lot of times we find that people will will choose those ratings to censor them. So we we want to we encourage librarians to use lots of different tools when they're um, selecting books. So whether it be book reviews or patron recommendations, um, maybe they read it themselves, all of those things are great. If they use Common Sense Media to also check in on it, that's wonderful. But it's not something that we're going to endorse um, as a selection policy, or I'm sorry, a selection tool. Um, because we think that there are more to books than just the martini glasses and the lips and the bombs that really narrow down what the content of the book is. There's more to it than that. And they rank things by age. And if you've ever worked with kids or teenagers, you know that every single kid is different. They come from a completely different background. Um, everybody is unique. I worked with teen volunteers and when I'm looking at 13 year olds, I have some that are sheltered and quiet and insecure and I have some that are mature for their age and adventurous and Families are all different, so to say that this one book is appropriate for all 13-year-olds um, is just not something that we can promote. Great, thank you. I've actually got another question for you, Kristen, um, straight away. Is what, um, were there any stats collected on the circulation of those ex-gay books that you added to your collection? Um, I'm sure there is. I, as I'm no longer an employee there, don't have them right now. But yeah, they could probably take a look and see what the circulation statistics are. But I don't know. Okay, I have a question now for, for all panelists. Has anyone had any experiences with censorship of student computers? Um, well, this is Kate. and. Uh, you know, every school district, just speaking from a school perspective, every school district has, you know, the mandatory filtering requirements, but um, other than that, every district has very different policies in terms of whether they block certain sites. Um, and I know that Michelle Ludela, who actually was the librarian who inspired me to be a librarian, I worked with her in New Canaan, Connecticut, um, she has really been heading up um, Banned Websites Awareness Day. Um, and I know that she hosted a webinar last week about um, about uh, what what kinds of sites are are censored in different school districts. Did anyone else want to jump in on that question? Or shall we move on? At uh, at Mansfield, what we tend to do is as long as it's legal. As long as it uh, doesn't violate a law, we're okay with it. I know a lot of people don't agree with that, but that's that's their right. I think we at Index on Censorship would certainly agree with you wholeheartedly there, Scott. Um, the, another question for everybody again, how do library, pat um, library patrons address concerns about the library collections, lack of material on subjects that are underrepresented in the library's holding because of self-censorship during the collection development decision? Uh, Scott, again, I know one of the issues that we, how we've addressed that in certain ways is, uh, yes, I do believe we've, uh, we've faced some self-censorship from uh, certain librarians on various topics, but we also have a... Um, a, numerous avenues for them to talk to other librarians, uh, electronic um, places to put requests in, down to the old paper drop slot. And I can tell you that uh, those are given very serious consideration uh, for inclusion, if it, if it, uh, particularly if it balances the collection. 
I can tell you one of the biggest areas we had a problem with this past uh, few years was uh, some of the librarians here weren't all, they didn't feel that Fifty Shades was appropriate for an academic library um, just because of the topic. And we were able to include it and uh, everybody handled it civilly. So this is Kristen, and another thing that I would recommend for patrons is really, like Scott said, to talk to the librarians and, and um, express the desire for those materials. Um, but take a look at the library selection policy and making sh make sure that the um, specific books that you're recommending fit within their, their selection policy. Um, even if you've got a librarian who is self-censoring, if you can show them that you meet these qualifications for a book to be included in their collection, can't, how can they say no? Um, so, you know, come armed with the facts, as you know. Um, yeah. And this is Kate, and I would just say, you know, speaking as a one-woman show, as many school librarians and small libraries are, um, it's really important when you don't have that. Um, on-site check of other librarians to help you think about self-censorship, it's really important to create that community yourself, either with other librarians in your district or area. And it is just one of those areas that I think we need to be honest with ourselves and with our colleagues about. Great, thank you. There's a, another question for Kristen. Um, how do you recommend that academic libraries work with college or university administrations when parents or students are offended about books they come across? Anything you'd like to add on that? Well, um, probably Scott would know be a much better advice on this one. Um, I, I would really talk about their collection policies and their reconsideration forms. Uh, yes, very much so. Um, I know whenever we've got it, we try to talk about the balance collection. We talk, try to talk about uh, the greatest selection policy is if you don't like it, you don't have to read it. Um, but our policy is, is open to both sides. We try to give a fair and balanced approach to things. Uh, we are not supporting one point or another. We are just uh, the resource. And like Kristen said very much, we've got a, uh, a collection development policy that is posted for the world to see. Our selections, um, it deals with a fair and balanced approach. And um, we try to offend it, equally offend everybody. Thank you. You know, and, and this is Kate, and I'm not in an academic library, but just speaking from a school perspective, um, I, just, I just really think it's important to be proactive and before any challenges happen, even if nothing is going on, just making it part of that annual check-in with your administrators, uh, maybe even creating a go-to list of links of where they can go to find the materials they need for when a complaint comes in. Um, because administrators have so many different things that they're dealing with and so many um, fronts to consider, so the easier we can make it for administrators to access those um, those materials and those steps for handling an issue responsibly and according to our policies, I think the better off we're all going to be. Great, thank you, thank you all. Unfortunately, I think we've run out of time now. The hour's gone very quickly. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us and a special thank you to the speakers and thanks on behalf of Index on Censorship for, for allowing me to moderate. Uh, in the coming weeks, look out for an email that includes a link to the entire webinar and the slides, as well as answering some of the questions that we didn't have time to get to today. So there's plenty coming in. Um, please stay connected uh, with, the, with the blog, Sage Connection, for information about upcoming webinars. Thanks. Thanks all.